Hello, I'm Pilgrim Beard of Device Pilot. And with me here today, I'm delighted to welcome Simon Daniel, who's co-founder and CEO of Moixa. Welcome, Simon. Hi. So how did you, I mean, I think of you, I think all, ever since I've known you, which is quite a long time, you've been involved in energy. Uh, was Moixa the first energy thing you did or did, did you do other energy things before that? How did you get started in smart energy? Yes, yeah, so Chris and I set up Moixa uh, just over 15 years ago. And uh, initially, we were collaborating on advanced mobile devices, looking at things like smartwatches and rollable displays, and then realized there was an issue with uh, the, how the, the batteries in these products uh, to be sort of special, uh, and also how they were charged. We didn't like having large AC-DC adapters to power you know, the future sort of trajectory of smart devices. And so we, we then sort of pivoted and set up Moixer Energy to do energy R&D uh, around battery technologies around charging uh, and then around smart home technology. So you're right, so it's actually the battery the battery role and the battery technology is the, the, the sort of main thing right from the beginning, interesting. Um, so can you just give us a quick sort of summary of what, what Moixer actually does today? What is, what is your business today? Yeah, so, so we, we evolved from launching then a consumer battery, USB rechargeable battery, and doing early R&D in what the future smart home, electrified home might look like, to then making one of the first smart batteries uh, for homes, and then focusing on the software to run on our battery and other, other people's batteries to look at really how you charge a battery intelligently uh, around uh, solar, around tariffs, uh, and then how you group lots of batteries together to aggregate a large fleet to become a sort of a grid scale battery. And we apply that technology today in homes for thousands of batteries in the UK and uh, over 30,000 in Japan. Uh, and we also apply it to smart charge uh, Honda uh, e-vehicles in Europe. It's a very similar approach to work out how to smart charge a battery in a home to smart charge a vehicle as they suffer similar uh, sort of challenges of how you a price uh, of carbon of, of solar availability. Yeah, interesting. So yes, this huge big battery that starts to come into everyone's lives in the form of a, of a vehicle. Um, really fascinating. Actually, I'm, I'm interested, uh, you're, you're a UK company originally, uh, but you do seem to have had a lot of traction in Japan recently. Yes. What, why, where, how did that come about? Is, is Japan just a particularly good market or, or did there, was there a particular need or how did that all happen? It, it, it came about through sort of two reasons. One was sort of, we were seeking investment uh, and secondly, there are a lot of similarities between the transition uh, Japan is going through uh, and what UK uh, is going through. Uh, we're both islands. And, the, and, and as we don't, don't get, uh, well, most of the energy we have is produced locally. So 95% of the UK electricity comes from local sources. We have uh, a few gigawatts of interconnector to Europe, but we can't rely on that, particularly as prices change in Europe. Uh, so we have to, as a, as a nation, as an island, work out how to manage uh, our growth in renewable energy sources, which is intermittent, uh, with uh, new regulations which allow uh, use of customer resources, use of batteries, flexibility markets. So you know, arguably countries like the UK have to get this right and have a regulation which is several years ahead of other countries. And so Japan is a similar uh, going through a similar transition. They're an island. Uh, they're transitioning away from nuclear. They're adopting more renewable energy. They look to the regulatory markets and innovations in the UK, uh, such as the deregulation waves, and they've copied that in Japan. And as a result, there are quite a lot of technologies uh, UK companies have been demonstrating, which are, are very portable to markets like Japan. And that also means that they become portable globally, as every city wants to be effectively a net zero island. Uh, and so if you look at the strategies uh, of places like sort of Illinois, you want to produce your energy locally, you want to measure uh, how much carbon it produces, and ultimately you take it right the way through to the home uh, and sort of new eco towns, you want the sort of everything to sort of have a net zero footprint. So what we learn in a country like UK, you know, helped get us investment in Japan and helps actually therefore be portable uh, to other countries. We've seen a similar uh, model in the United States where a lot of the early battery technologies were tested in Hawaii. Uh, because you could demonstrate that and work out how the ecosystem works. Uh, there's less, less people to talk to. There's a number of, there's a simple regulator there. Uh, and you test it there before deploying in a more complex state. So he sort of, you know, you know, it is a good question, why Japan? But there are 
you know, theoretical reasons and practical reasons why that turned out to be a very good source of investment. We ended up having, you know, raising about $20 million from companies like Tepco and then Itochu uh, and then Honda um, to sort of really be part of working with those companies. And uh, over our journey, we found actually, you know, whilst we sort of had initial funding from uh, the government of the UK for R&D projects, in order to make an impact as a as a UK company, we need to sort of work with very large channel partners. Uh, it kind of be be like this sort of tail fin on the airplane, or what Buckminster Fuller, Fuller once referred to as uh, be the trim tab, the thing which drives and turns the rudder, which then turns the direction of travel of this much bigger corporation. And so, working with these fifty billion dollar companies, even though you know, Moixer is a smaller British company we can actually impact the strategy and direction of some very big global companies. And that's really, you know, what are the sort of benefits of corporate venturing, working with strategics, and really something we encourage for other UK companies is find partners who have a capital to use your technology at scale. Uh, and so one man, one person, one woman can make a difference to the climate agenda by setting up technologies used and scaled, scaled through these kind of partners. Mm, well, nice to have a Buckminster Fuller reference there. Excellent. I mean, that that um, just to explore that a little bit, uh, the relationship between small companies and big companies, I mean, I totally understand what you're saying in that we know that small companies are much more agile uh, and can take risks that big companies um, perhaps don't dare to take. But um, you know, often the relationship between big companies and, and small companies isn't very uh, uh, good because they're just such different beasts. And you see this sometimes when when small companies are acquired and the, the whole culture just kind of stops dead. Um, uh, I mean, do, do you have any kind of lessons learned about the, that, that dance and how to get it how to get it right? It, it, it is a, it is a challenging area. So we, we found the Japan market very uh, good to work with uh, because they have a sort of a, a strategic approach to the market. They look at things over multi, multiple years and are very pragmatic about sort of how, how they adopt and roll out technology. Now, in practice, Japan is a very difficult market to access. And so you know, when Dyson uh, launched in, in Japan, you know, it was one of his first sort of scale-up markets. Indeed, they funded Dyson and all his tooling whilst leaving him the international rights to his products. And so, but you can't really, as, as an external company, work in Japan unless you're working with and through uh, the existing uh, uh, large channels there, A, from language, from culture, from regulation. So, you know, it, it's, a very, it's quite a good tactic to sort of work with these kind of companies, uh, but they need... Um, that agile, they need that technology, they need that sort of innovation to complement what they do. Um, I, I once in a, in a former consultancy role uh, did a project for the government of Singapore and, and countries like that like to copy technology, uh, but it's very difficult then to do a new innovation unless you show an output. As a, I showed them a sort of a 10-year article written in the future showing what they did as a press release and a, a sort of business 2.0 type story, and they could see that, read that, and then copy it. <laughs> I'd say, you know, but it's, it's in sort of cultural way, sort of innovations happen. I think Europe is a bit more complicated because you've got some conflict between what the energy companies want to do. Uh, and yes, there has been challenges where you know, they overinvest in a company or buy a company and the culture changes. And certainly we've seen that with some of the oil and gas acquisitions that uh, the companies sort of therefore change. On the other side is, you know, we have to change the oil and gas companies. <laughs> You know, they have to change their entire business model towards renewables. So it, it's a, uh, you know, we need to end up with a collaboration. Uh, and so when I went to COP, it was really interesting. Uh, I went to a, an energy forum beforehand with all the oil and gas executives. And in the room, you know, we had 80% of oil and gas. And that's the room which needs to change. But when I went to COP, they weren't really invited. And it was kind of sort of protesters and lobbyists, but the people who can change the world were not really part of the debate and they need to be part of the debate and we need to have some managed compromise in order to transition these old world energy models into this new electrified world and and that sort of you know i think is is one of the roles of the innovative technologies to you know work with um, but also the, because of the, the energy tra transition means that the market caps of the future will be the companies who solve the problem. That's either an opportunity for companies who work with or for, the, or for companies like ourselves to really you know, take, take that market cap and Challenge. really make a difference yep. to scale. Yeah, great. So, so 
the world has changed a lot. So in terms of the kind of home battery storage market, um, you've been doing that now for what, about 15 years, something like that? So we, 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 in the early years, we were doing sort of energy R&D around consumer, around sort of power electronics. We have some yeah. patents from 2008 on the whole smart home ecosystem. And I think it's now cited by a few hundred companies. But we sort of then realized sort of around maybe 2010, that the sort of the, the the battery was a key part of that, okay. uh, and then and then sort of the software behind it. We ran a, a large energy storage demonstrator for DEC, the British government, in 2012 across a few hundred homes, which was probably one of the first sort of now called virtual power plant groupings of then a few hundred homes using batteries and trying to deploy them all at once for uh, uh, something like a flexibility event when there's a, a challenge on the grid or demand needed. And so we were very, very early before companies like Tesla in, in a sort of developing the technology and testing it and finding then out what works. And that taught us a lot around sort of power electronics around batteries, but it really taught us around the role of software to control mm -hmm. these things reliably yep. and then be agile to, to adapt to how markets change. You know, prices yep. got them down. Uh, we had 75 pounds per per kilowatt ask for national grid this week for um, on the balancing market. And so you, know, you, you want to be able to respond to that. So if you make something um, sort of based around some model future, you need to constantly sort of adapt that as regulation changes, as market changes, as geopolitical things change, as we'll see uh, in the next few weeks. Yes, indeed. Um, so the world has changed a lot during that time then that you've been, you've been doing this. Um, and so I suppose if I ask you a question of what would you what would you have done differently or kind of less interesting lessons learned, how could you have got to the goal quicker or were there any blind alleys or yes. any of that kind of stuff? I mean, often over that kind of time frame, the world has changed. And so, you know, they're not useful lessons, perhaps because we're now in a different reality. But I mean, do, are there any kind of, were there any big insight moments where you suddenly realized that you should behave differently or the world didn't look the way you thought it did or, uh, you know, that might not be obvious to someone sort of coming at this? Um, um, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, there's been a number. We've seen sort of, you know, the financial recession in 2008 and nine. So, you know, we didn't plan on that. We had a, a deal in progress and that certainly slowed down the activity. We've seen a few different ways of clean tech. And so uh, actually sort of processing that and, Obviously, there's been waves of clean tech in the 70s. The Carl Sagan gave a very you know, famous address to Congress saying, come on, sort it out. And the world didn't. And now the problem is even harder because we didn't change policies and approaches decades ago. And so you know, the, our message has adapted over time from you know, maybe being a bit more hardware centric initially to being more software centric. But in practice, you know, the, the next few years still require hardware to work reliably. So you can't roll out software to the world mm. like an app store. Um, yep. So you know, the first half of this decade is very much dependent on working with good battery partners, having reliable hardware in homes and vehicles, and having software which is adaptable to run that. I think you know, over the you know, next five to 10 years, there may be a transition where software standards stabilizes. We're seeing a bit in the uh, e-mobility space where you know, people interpret the, the, the standards differently and they're not quite ubiquitous, but you know, by the end of the decade, they need to be ubiquitous. But it's still very much a, a phase where you have to work and uh, with hardware and make vertically integrated solutions. And so we started with that and some people said, focus on one, and then we sort of slightly pivoted into more software uh, and then we pivoted into collaborating with people who make the hardware. So there's been nuances over our time. I think we were also a bit, bit too innovative early. So innovation is a bit like comedy. It's making a joke or making a connection ahead of an audience, which when you give it to the audience, they get it and have a reaction. And if you, if you said something sort of before the context exists, you know, the audience wouldn't laugh. You know, if you said something, if you had a repeat of, uh, have I got news for you, the British comedy show, um, you know, based around something that the previous government was doing, it's just not funny because there's no current context. And so innovation and also financing innovation mm. has to sort of hit this sweet spot between the investors getting it, uh, the consumers beginning to understand this is coming in order for you to have a market to sell the products in a reasonable time. Mm. Um, but, but the world is so connected today that, that to be truly innovative and get a patent is difficult because you have to be several years ahead of the market in order to make a new connection. So there's this trade-off about you know, being too innovative, but being unique enough 
to own IP and own new technology um, and then executing it well. Um, but if you're too early, then financing is difficult. We had to fund our company through a lot of innovation grants, through uh, you know, selling some proxy products, um, and then we use that. And, and then suddenly when the, the market base really began in, for example, energy storage, when uh, companies like Tesla launched storage, then it was much easier to raise the sort of tens of millions of dollars. And now you know, we're seeing a transition to you know, companies raising hundreds of millions of dollars, mm. particularly with the, uh, the, the SPAC market in the United States, because the technology is needed now. In fact, it was needed five, 10 years ago, but now we need to really catch up and scale companies to really electrify the world really super quickly. Yeah, yeah, I think um, the um, you know the uh, the idea of being ahead of your time is one I can certainly <laughs> certainly identify with it, and, and sort of constantly building your um, building your proposition so you can sort of make money all the way along, as it, as it were. Um, so one thing you touched on a little bit there as you started to think about the next few years was the, the having to join everything up and that's certainly yeah. a theme that someone else i spoke to recently harriet allman carter of light source labs touched on you know just the challenge of all the different things that they're going to be in the home yeah. for example um regarding smart energy and and the, the sort of issues of technical standards of actually getting stuff joined up could you just sort of paint a picture for us um, of, of if you think about the typical UK home, the typical Japanese home over the next, say, five years? You know, battery storage, I suppose, is going to be something that hits people's consciousness. I wouldn't have yeah. said it is probably in their consciousness for most people right now. I think if you went down a man and you know and talked to a man in a pub today, they, they wouldn't necessarily come think of battery uh, storage. They might think of electric cars. Um, but it, it feels like we're sort of on the cusp of that. Um, what, what, you know, what other parts of the ecosystem are going to emerge or, or, or become common, you know, mainstream things over the next five years that, that might interact with the battery? I mean, can you just sort of paint a picture of the, yeah, yeah, of so, the ecosystem so, that, that yeah. your average person, your average consumer might experience? So, so the, the, the average consumer, in fact, all consumers are facing this, this you know, first phase of the bill shock. So the energy transition uh, is going to be significant and, and very difficult because we have to replace the entire global energy infrastructure away from fossil fuels and replace it with a fully electrified grid uh, within the next 10 to 15 years. And then we need to do that again in order to support electrification of mobility and probably again to support electrification of heat. So the amount of infrastructure we need as new renewable technology between now and 2050 it is exceptional. And so we need that transition to happen. There's a lot of thinking that a good way to achieve decarbonization is electrification of homes, which means everything in the home from you know, the, the vehicle to the electricity is renewable to uh, the, the heating uh, to everything else. And that gives resilience because uh, you can manage uh, a greater shift to renewables with wind and solar, but you need a lot of storage to make that, that approach work. Uh, and so we need this great transition. And, and behind the pricing shock is you know, the oil and gas companies used to be able to write a 30 year contract selling their energy to someone on what was called a 30 year sort of power purchase agreement. Now they can't even get five because companies, companies who, who are their clients sort of are not really sure whether they're going to be allowed to buy this kind of energy or the carbon pricing mm. in five years' time. But the reality behind that means that the energy is going to be much more expensive if, if a big company is trying to offset their big infrastructure investment in old world fossil fuel and have it paid back in five years, then they're going to be higher prices. And equally, the world is growing. We're going to hit 8 billion people by this time next year. And so we're adding a France worth of consumption every year. Uh, and that means more gas consumption, let alone the local geopolitics. So behind that is this sort of need to electrify. And so behind the story of bills is really a need and opportunity, both from an individual perspective, as well as the client perspective, to put in uh, low carbon technology. And the best way to do that uh, sort of typically is solar in someone's home. But to make solar useful, you need storage. Mm -hmm. So storage is a sort of missing link between making renewables, which are intermittent, uh, work to sort of pull down and store and shift to the evening to avoid peak prices. And that's either a battery in your home or use of a battery in your car uh, in different sort of models. And so that's the sort of space we work in, uh, but it's also the anchor for doing change in a home. If you do, it's the first thing you should really do is solar and battery uh, and then, then EV and then, uh, then other forms of electrification of heat um, and so forth. Obviously there's other 
uh, you know, efficiency things you can do in your home from lighting through to uh, insulation and other things to reduce your uh, total consumption. Uh, but the role of, uh, of renewable technology of batteries and solar is really critical and accessible mm -hmm. to, to a large proportion of society, uh, particularly now solar costs are very, very affordable. And it's cheaper now in new countries to obviously build solar and batteries to build a new grid. And so there's also sort yep. of benefits. But to, back to your connected point, this you know, creates a, an increase in complexity of households. They need to be connected to Wi-Fi or the future Wi-Fi. They need to be connected to your phone or uh, beyond when your phone exists. These are products which are going to be in homes for decades, uh, whereas they have much longer lifespans than, say, your phone does. But the whole thing needs to stay connected mm -hmm. uh, in order for you know th these notions of smart home and smart grid to work. And that creates a range of technical challenges uh, from the physical hardware through to the software, through to the standards, through to the connectivity, uh, as well as the ultimate usability of the systems. From, from the perspective of a, a consumer, so solar, you stick it on your house and it does what it does, doesn't really need management. A battery needs a lot more management because there's a lot more strategy. In fact, one of the things I hadn't realized until uh, you know a few years ago when I started thinking about it properly was um, you know you you need to know the future to to, to use batteries well. Um, probably I, I would maybe you disagree with that, but uh, um, you know a little bit like the stock market, you might want to keep a bit of cash in your portfolio so when the market dips, you've got something to invest with. Likewise, you probably don't want your battery to be yeah. full all the time because otherwise you've got nowhere to put an when when you have some spare so there's a lot of uh, and you know is it going to be sunny today um what what's the person's pattern of use going to be um you know what else is going on in the world what's the price of electricity going to be i mean there's a lot of moving uh, variables there and a lot of interactions and externalities some of which you can control yes. and predict and some some not yes, you, can, you, can, you can predict the short the short term mm. um, the short term you can predict in the sense that you know, the, the way our uh, mods are smart uh, algorithms and our grid share software works is take data on weather from satellite to local very precise locations so we know what the forecast weather for solar is you know, in your postcode in your area we know what the tariff forecasts are mm. so we, and we know what your consumption is and then there's uh, some use of ai machine learning to optimize your charging plan over the next 24 to 48 hours for your home battery and also for your vehicle. And so, yes, you're using, you are trying to predict the future uh, and you are trying to make uh, intelligent decisions based around something you're trying to optimize, whether it's resilience, if you know there's a storm coming, whether it's carbon, if you're trying to maximize or minimize your carbon, uh, if it's price, you're trying to avoid something for the end user. Uh, but these kind of tools also work for the retailer. The retailers need to be very good at managing the wholesale uh, uh, price, and if they're not, they typically go bust. So a lot of the challenges of the energy retail market in the UK is both the short-term trading challenge and also these long-term trends like gas prices. But if a company's not good at trading, then uh, they've got a problem. If they can use batteries to uh, and intelligent software to, to be better, that's mm. one advantage. If they can use batteries to fix their position by you know, effectively like demand response, turning things on and off or, or, or using that as a way to avoid an imbalance charge, that's sort of even better. Um, but then, you, then if you look at the sort of wider longer term predictions, you know, you've obviously got to move away from these fossil fuels. Uh, there's a lot of free solar coming from, from the sky. There's a lot of need for resilience in grid systems. There's a lot of, there's a lot of benefit now. Things are connected to have your products used uh, as part of a collective and so then the economics creates a sort of virtuous circle. Uh, mm. But it does depend on using the algorithms and using um, connectivity well. And so in this sort of broader space of Internet of, uh, internet of Things, there is a challenge because there's, say, 100 billion things. You know, half of them are fast-moving disposable goods like phones and maybe only last a year or operating systems which last six months and then change, whereas physical products are there for decades. Mm. And so there's a difference. There's still Internet of Things, but they've got to be connected over a decade. They've got to talk to the, the current markets mm. over a decade. They've got to talk to whatever consumer displays. 
they've got to be uh, adapt to the very security standards. So you know, even though you know, so there's, there's a harder challenge in managing you know, things which ha have a persistency for things which are sort of a very sort of temporal. Uh, I mean, I've got some solid speakers here and you know, it's quite difficult to talk to them if they're more than five years old, they stop, mm. they stop working. Yes, I've had exactly uh, the same experience. And uh, the same, yeah. same, same is true of you know, your phones and people drop standards, but you, know, you can't do that with renewable technology. You can't do that with cars. You might have a car for three years, you might have it for 30 years. It's still got to be connected. Uh, and so that's the emerging challenge in the Internet of Things. It wasn't just the first wave, which was you know, you know, way back to the sort of, you know, just let's connect to something, you know, you know, and do something interesting. It's cool, but you've got to constantly do that reliably over yep. time with low yep. service costs. So you paint a picture of a battery as an asset, which with good management can have benefits to all sorts of parties. And one can imagine all sorts of ways that the economics of that might play out. But just thinking about it resolutely from the perspective of the consumer, an early adopter consumer with a battery, you know, you or me or Robert Llewellyn or someone like that, probably would have great fun tinkering about with the, you know, try, trying to connect stuff up and algorithms and and sort of, you know, looking at LEDs going on and off and all that sort of stuff. It's all great fun. But your average mainstream consumer has neither the um, knowledge or the, or the time um, to to be doing that, and and they want stuff to just just work. I mean, if you look at most of the energy infrastructure we have today, it just works. You don't have to think about it. Um, yes. So how do you think batteries are going to be sold to consumers that gives them that? that, that? I mean, what will they, as a, as a consumer, if, if my utility, for example, or someone else offers me a battery, what, what, what will the deal be in, in a way that I can afford it and understand it and not, not have to do too much uh, sort of management myself? Yeah, so so there's, there's two aspects. So there's there's one which is obviously batteries in homes are useful, um, but the the software which manages those kind of things is is portable across different kinds of asset, whether it's the uh, the electric vehicle or whether it's kind of managing a, a range of different batteries for the utility. So whether you have one in your home or kind of relying on storage in the local grid in, in another format, the same principles apply. Um, and again, that's around basically you know, saving your money and saving carbon. But you're right that there's a difference in the early adopter phase and, and, in, and, the, and the scale up phase where you know, you, typically you, you gain the trust of the consumer and then you automate. And so you, know, you, you, know, you don't, you know, you, you, individuals may get highly engaged in the energy and want information such as the real time displays, uh, the RTDs people had. Um, in, in the UK a few years ago, but after a while, you know, RTD becomes return to draw. You've used it, you understand it, you put it in the draw, and you maybe then trust the utility to manage things for you. So it's a stage in educating, making things aware, helping change, and then you trust the software to mm -hmm. automate and run things for you. Now, yeah. the you know, there's a generalized sort of you know, worry about at what point do you trust, say, AI or trust third party? And so, you know, you know the, the, the emergence of autonomous vehicles. So at the moment, there's maybe a generalized concern about at what point, you know, do you allow AI to run something for you? Now, an AI will run part of your airplane you're in. And if you allow yourself to be driven in a future autonomous vehicle, then at that point, you're probably trusting AI for, for a whole range of things which are, are less sort of life critical in a sense, because you know, if it's going to drive you in a car, you're probably going to trust it to, yep. to turn up yep. the heating. Okay, so, well, if we just stay away from the Terminator scenario, I mean, if we assume that whoever pays the bills is a person who ultimately has some control, what, um, you know, will I will I buy a battery as a capital asset and have to stump up the capital yeah. cost? And will I then buy a service to manage it and pay for that on a, on a monthly basis? Or will I get this as a kind of monthly deal for my utility wrapped yeah, up so, with a carrier? So, um, I, I think there's sort of, there's definitely a sort of worldwide trajectory towards uh, sort of energy or heating uh, or mobility as a service. And so you know, ultimately, if it's owned by an asset fund, then that asset fund you know, has the ability to sort of buy the best kind of grid shed technologies or, or, or you know, tech source batteries and can actually manage things more efficiently. Um, it comes down to, you know, in that, in that movie that's sort of about um, Nash, uh, the Beautiful Mind, where there's a scene with the mathematics behind it in terms of this sort of, um, it's both game theory, but it's it's about collaboration, that if you each compete uh, against each other for the prize, then you end up with a less optimized solution. If you all collaborate, 
then you end up with a better efficiency. So a home needs to collaborate with the utility, which needs to collaborate with the network, which needs to collaborate with the grid and all the renewable generation sources in order to work out what's best. If a home makes a decision based around the home only data, it you know I want to keep my energy because it's mine and it, I buy it back at 15p, but there was 75 pounds per kilowatt pricing yesterday temporarily on a future contract, which you know, very few people would know about, but you know, someone else would have that information. So you kind of need to trust the collaborative system to optimize. And you know, a perfect view of the future grid is whilst a lot of technology today is to sort of manage down peaks, uh, but you know, to some extent, the perfect future grid would be completely flat. It would maximize uh, all existing metal in the ground, and there would be no price variation because everything would be automated to keep um, the overall system in total uniform balance. You know, in practice, we have this extreme peak in the evening because that's how our cycles work and so it creates a, a surplus peak during the day. Um, but if you have lots of connected electric vehicles, today we've got around uh, you know 10 gigawatt hours of batteries in vehicles in the UK. Uh, that's a bit bigger than Denorig, the pumped hydro station in Wales, uh, on, on a strategy to electrified mobility by 2035 in the UK will end up with 800 gigawatt hours, 100 Denorigs sitting in the electric vehicle fleet of the UK. That's costing you know, tens of billions of dollars of chemistry, but forms you know, the equivalent to multiple nuclear power plants sitting in people's drives, sitting in streets, all working together uh, to balance the, the wind fleets, to balance the solar fleets, to keep, keep the demand flat and keep carbon down. But that needs to be orchestrated with software in a collaborative way, uh, with homes working with local networks, working with grid, not just sort of one or the other. But mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, the smart grid tech companies, the smart utilities will have slightly better information around, as you say, predicting the future. <laughs> um, and, if, and if these are all owned by asset funds, then that, that's ultimately sort of uh, one particular model to do. Now, you know, today we see a lot of evidence that you know, if, if you buy these products, you could save money, you're investing in your future. Uh, and so over, you know, over a term of you know, 10 to 20 years, it's obviously better to insulate your home and put double glazing in and do LED lighting, put solar on the roof and go off bill. Um, but you don't necessarily see a payback intra year on that. You mm. see a payback in, in keeping your energy flat over decades. Mm. And so you, 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 you need to sort of have the funding made available to that uh, or someone else taking the, the ownership of it and then sharing uh, certain benefits to each participant. Yeah, it's fasc fascinating when the technology becomes sort of cheap enough and, and reliable enough that it becomes a sort of fundable asset and then the whole world of finance can, can and, start. And, so, and so, look, you know, quite clearly is mm. and was, particularly when there was an yep. incentive from government, which mm. guaranteed the payment. Mm. But, but you're right, these smart technologies are more complex than solar because they need you know, software to maintain. Um, and so you can't fit and forget something. You need to keep these systems live, connected, plugged in and uh, adapt. So yep. the work we do in the United States, for example, um, there's obviously a FERC, which is the regulation around uh, flexibility enabling you know, domestic and distributed assets to participate in grids. Uh, there's a, a various sort of changes to the sort of net metering rules underway. And depending on which state you're in and which um, government you're in, you have to kind of do things differently. And so, you know, in the UK, we maximize solar self-consumption with our batteries because uh, you, you get paid a feed-in tariff uh, and you want to sort of keep your own energy to avoid buying your energy back in the evening. Uh, in Japan, uh, a lot of homes uh, get paid the most by exporting all their energy during the day for a feed-in tariff. So we try to minimize self-consumption uh, until they leave that contract, in which case we then try to maximize. So you, we, we alternate depending on what the goal is mm. and regulation adds to the top of that. So you need you know, someone to be a steward of these assets um, you know, all the time uh, and you can't just sort of, and therefore they're harder to finance because it's not just a simple spreadsheet where you just say, okay, I, I put this in and someone pays me X per year backed off by the treasury. Um, that's not how it works. But if you look at the overall cost of energy, um, it's incredibly expensive for households. And uh, you know, I, I did a model for the British government called net zero pensions once, which looked at you know, you know, if you want to retire today, you might need 50,000 pound lump sum to buy uh, a, an annuity, which pays you 1300 pounds uh, per year um, energy cap. So if you want to pay your energy through retirement, 
take your lump sum and buy a contract which pays your energy bill. Now, that's obviously now even worse given the price cap is mm. going to rise. So you might need £100,000 or to buy an index link product. And so if you realize the numbers involved, then suddenly spending a few thousand pounds on a battery or solar um, makes a lot of sense because you go off bill. And the mm-hmm. same thing is you can justify buying an electric vehicle as a retirement choice because you have a much reduced fuel bill and you have a much reduced maintenance bill. So should you have £50,000 uh, in a bank and buy an, a contract which pays your fuel bill each year, or should you have a Tesla on the drive, which you can drive and also del- deliver a low carbon environment? Now, the, ch- the difficulty is very few people have £50,000 in the bank. The government pays your bill. And so the government's currently looking at, you know, okay, energy pricing, but ultimately the government is paying through the state pension uh, or the welfare system, a lot of the country's energy bills through retirement. And so I think there's some opportunity to do joined up mm. thinking here and look at what the transition is. But it comes down to you know, financing questions. And, and at the end of the day, you know, it's easier for someone to make a decision now to say, I oh, will just pay the bill rather than you know, borrow the money. Um, and so you need you know, advice and companies to sort of you know, offer services or products which help simplify that such that it becomes a, a fair and equitable choice. Yeah, taking the risk maybe, yeah. Fascinating. Well, Simon, this has been a, you know, a fascinating tour de force across the, the industry and the past and the future. Um, really interesting. Now, I think in a slight break to, to our standard form, uh, I think you promised us a little bit of a, a treat, a bit of a bit of insight into your own home and how... Oh, yeah, so uh, let, how let me works. show you a, a couple of things here. So um, I probably just need to just just go outside. So if you if you bear with me, I'll just yep. to rejoin on the other network. Great. One second. Hi. Hi again. You can see this. So yes, yeah, so I've just relocated to my garage. Uh, just so that these things are real. And so behind me, there's an example: five kilowatt hour battery system uh, and inverter uh, and some metering technology. And that's connected to um, it's about five kilowatt hours of solar on the roof. And so you know, this is kind of a tip- typical for a, a home battery installation. You're using solar during the day, you're storing some of the battery, and then it's going to deploy the battery uh, sort of later in the evening. And uh, so this is one of our, our systems, and it's also powering a uh, electric vehicle outside. So if I just drop it, drop here, um, you can see that. Yeah, so there's a, an alpha charger here, mm-hmm. uh, which is a, this is pulling energy from solar, except it's a bit rainy today, and it's powering an electric vehicle. So this is something which becomes more ubiquitous over time as the technologies become simpler. So there is more more presence in the new building and more people adopt electric vehicles. Fascinating. Thanks for showing us that, Simon. And uh, that's a wonderfully novel end to uh, a discussion like this. Thanks so much for sharing your (laughs) thoughts with us and and showing us your installation. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.